I'm Daniel Wordsworth. I've led humanitarian relief efforts in just about every disaster, natural and man-made, for the last 30 years. Smuggled into North Afghanistan in a helicopter after 9-11, made the overland route to Kyiv in the early days of the Ukraine invasion. And I led an emergency team into Sri Lanka after the East Asia tsunami. Across all continents, I've seen the worst of humanity. Terrible tragedy in places like Darfur, Congo, and Somalia. Horrors even worse than you can imagine. I've been in wars, famines, and epidemics. But here's the thing. Having experienced and seen all of this, I believe the world is abundant. As humans, we can make a difference. And I know, not believe, I know that humans are good. The way you see the world is how the world will show up for you. And in this podcast, I'll explain why. We'll talk to leaders, people making a difference, and we'll discuss the issues that impact us as they happen. Welcome to Finding Good with Daniel Wordsworth. Now, my name's Fitz, and I'm basically your tour guide through Daniel's mind. And if you're new to the podcast, thank you for choosing to listen, and thank you to everyone who's been listening so far. If you have a question for Daniel, or you hear anything you'd like to comment on on the podcast, you can do that through the website, danielwordsworth.com. Follow Daniel on the socials, and make sure you subscribe to the podcast if you haven't yet on Spotify or Apple or wherever it is you're listening to the show. Daniel, I'm reticent to use the term climate change right. because I almost feel like people don't hear it anymore. Right, they don't. It's wallpaper. It's a, It's no longer a call to action. It's been overused and misused and misappropriated. But it's still an important conversation. Right. Most recently we saw Al Gore at the World Economic Forum. Right. I don't know whether he's being alarmist or not. Certainly alarmed me. You know, he's talking about some amazing numbers, 162 million tonnes of carbon emissions being released into the atmosphere every day. He likened it to... 600,000 atomic bombs going off every single day like Hiroshima. I think that's the one that will stick in people's minds. That's a frightening number. ...exploding every single day on the earth. That's what's boiling the oceans, creating these atmospheric rivers and the rain bombs and sucking the moisture out of the land and creating the droughts and melting the ice and raising the sea level and causing these waves of climate refugees... Is it accurate? Do we know if it's accurate? I mean, what is the, what is the purpose uh, of I that? think in the area of social change, we've been convinced on this idea that the greatest way to persuade people is to create fear and anxiety. Yep, so, you know, you want to get... It's like uh, in... Uh, Business strategy, they call it creating a burning platform, right? That if you can convince everybody that this platform you're on is burning, then everybody's going to be forced to act and they're going to jump and they're going to make some change. And it's, we're so entrenched in our own way of working that the only way we're going to bust out of this is by being panicked out. And so we create these things. So I believe that climate change has gone into that. I actually believe that the, the world's refugee crisis is part of that. There's not a single earthquake, epidemic or crisis that occurs where somebody um, doesn't say, this is the worst of X that's ever happened since Y, right? So we try to amp everything up. And with climate change, we've amped everything up. That is not to say that the problems aren't real in any of those issues that I'm talking about. But we're using a, an approach to persuade people or um, push people into action that seems to be oriented around creating fear. The problem with that approach is that over time, people can't stay fearful for that long, right? It, it, if you're on the burning platform and people are trying to panic you and after a while you don't do anything, you just discover that, well, the platform's still here. So, uh, you know, Vice President Gore is a great example of this. He's one of the greats at this and he has put his life into this. So again, this is not a dish on him in any way. But I think the idea of telling us that there are 600,000 Hiroshima-style atomic bombs going off every day, personally, I think that's a jump to shark moment because what are you going to do with that piece of news? Hmm. Yeah. It's too much. It's, it's overwhelming. It's got to that point. And it's almost to the point where you, I, I can't, it's unfathomable. I can't imagine it. So how is that helpful? <laughs> right. <laughs> Except there's a vague feeling like, oh, well, the world's over then. Yeah, well, that's probably not good. Yeah, that's like... <laughs> Uh, soup in a in a not to ten not being um, not good and ten being super awesome, it's somewhere <laughs> right down the zero level, right? Six hundred thousand Hiroshima-style nuclear bombs every single day. Yeah. 
But what do you do with that? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to add to this story. Right? There have been two things that have gone viral in the last month related to climate. There's the Al Gore speech in Davos mm. and there's the Constantine Kissin speech at the Oxford Union. We are told that your generation cares more than any other about one issue in particular, and that issue is climate change. You wish to save the planet. And for tonight, and tonight only, I will join you. I will join you in worshipping at the feet of St. Greta of climate change. <laughs> Let us all accept... His speech was almost like the other end of the spectrum, right? So the point that he made, in, and it's been viewed like 50 million times in the last few weeks, his point was he stood up there and said... What can we in Britain do? This country is responsible for 2% of global carbon emissions which means that if Britain was to sink into the sea right now, it would make absolutely no difference to the issue of climate change. So all of the action, all of the climate-related action that occurs in England affects 2% of carbon going into the atmosphere. His point being that all the recycling, all of the plastic straw not drinking, all of the flights not taking that happens in England mm -hmm. means nothing. And then his point was... Where is the battle of climate change actually being fought? Because the future of the climate is going to be decided in Asia and in Latin America by poor people who couldn't give a shit about saving the planet. You know why? Because they're poor. And he says that while for us the dilemma is that when we go to Starbucks, do I have a plastic straw or not? The way that this decision, this sort of decision-making matrix for a poor person is... Will I have an inside, an outside toilet? Let me use the example of Soviet-era Russia. He said, mm. we didn't even have toilets that were proper toilets. He said, if you're going to tell me that I'm going to have to not have a toilet to protect the world's climate, I'm going to pick the toilet every time. I mean a wooden shack with a hole in the ground that holds a collected fermented memory of the last 10,000 visits. <laughs> How many of you are going to go home tonight and say, let's rip out our bathroom and erect a Siberian shithouse in the back garden. <laughs> and if you're not, why should they? And it's his, basically his argument. Poor people every day are making decisions, trying to create a life for themselves, trying to make a life for their children, and they are not, in their, in their decision-making matrix, they are not going to factor climate into how they decide those questions. Now, if you said to me that I had a choice, either my son had a serious risk of starving or dying from a preventable disease in the next year. Or I could press a button and he would live. He would go to school. He would bring his first girlfriend home. He'd go to university. And then he'd get a job and get married and have children and become a man. But all I have to do is press this button. And for every day of my son's life, a giant plume of CO2 is going to re get released into the atmosphere. Now, you're all very young, and most of you are not parents. Let me tell you something. There is not a parent in the world who would not smash that button so hard their hand bled. And so he basically is then saying, so we have to address global poverty before we can really address climate change. Well, that's a version of it. So the, the paper straw, right. is that just virtue signalling then by middle-class Westerners? I think it's more than that. I think people are genuinely saying, didn't you just tell me there were 600,000 Hiroshima-style atomic bombs going off every single day? I'm going to have to do something on this. Mm. I'm a resp I believe most human beings look in the mirror every day and think, I, I'm a good person. I have promise. If you have children, you know they're looking at you and you want them to be proud of you more than anything else. And most of us don't want to get to the end of our life and feel like we've been nothing but a dead weight on this earth. And then, in fact, all we've done is left some... We've done nothing to advance goodness in this place. Most of us want to get to the end of our lives and think, I played my part. I did good, actually. I did what I could. And so I think in the face of all the stuff that people are saying about climate... People are like, well, I can suck on a paper straw or I can reduce my travel. I can recycle my stuff. i got to do something, right? Yeah. Mm. So it's it, to your point in the last episode, you can't do anything on your own, but they are never on your own. It does impact, but it's not impacting at scale. 
So we should be moving the conversation away from how do I fix climate change to how do I help with the poverty problem in the world to then address Well, I think that's change. the point that he's advocating. I, 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 and it's hard for me to speak on his behalf. I, you have two ends. You have one person creating this feeling like if we don't do something in the next 10 minutes, we're all going to die. So in answer to your question, I would Viral. say... We have to have a sense of urgency much greater than we have yet had. We've heard about divides. Same in this time frame, someone else going viral. The There's nothing you can do. Suck it up, give up. There's nothing you can do. It would make absolutely no difference to the issue of climate change. And how does a person respond to the same two viral messages? It's, you know, the average young person is looking at both of these and going, which one of these is valid? Which one of these two things is true? And it's a question I was asked by my daughter because I've been working in sort of social change, impact space, all that stuff for a long time and for, certainly for her entire life. She's 20 now. But she asked me through her teens all the time. She would say, I know, Dad, you're helping refugees. I know you're helping poor people around the world. What are you doing about climate change? And I would say to her and did say to her for the longest time, I'm not doing anything really about it. And then she would say, why not? And I would say, because... There's really, I mean, I, there's nothing really we can do about it. Yep. It, it's a horrible thing to have to say to your daughter. Yeah. No no 15-year-old looks at you with yeah. <laughs> admiration when you deliver you a message that. like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, you guys ruined it, so yeah. well, now you're telling me you can't do anything about right. it. Right. And you can imagine that's why a person like Greta gets so full of rage and fury. Yeah. Yep. Now, am I saying there's nothing you can do about it now? No, I'm not, and hopefully we'll get into this. But I would say um, we're stuck right now between a rock and a hard place and we need a way out of it. And the rock and the hard place, you must do something, there's nothing you can do. Is there a third way on this thing? And, and a way I used to think about it up until just very recently, and, and it's a story I'm, I'm sort of harking back from my days when I was in the Navy. It was, you know, after the Falklands War and the Exocet missile became very famous during that time frame. That's what the Argentinians sunk some British ships using this Exocet missile. Mm -hmm. It's like a surface-to-a-ship missile. Right. And I remember one of the chief petty officers was joking with us at the time. He said, there's a checklist that we have for Exocet missiles that you have on the bridge of the ship. You know, so you're on a warship. And then somebody says, Exocet, that's oh, on the radar screen, Exocet missile coming in, sir. And you pull out the checklist. And the checklist is like 45, takes 45 <laughs> seconds to do it. Turn the green button 10 degrees to the right. Turn, look to the left and say to the sailor, you know, avast or whatever. You know, it's like 40, 45 seconds worth of things you have to do. Turn around twice. Look up to the sky. The last one says, hang on. And then we were like, well, what was the point of all the other checklist points? And they were like, well, there's nothing worse than panic. <laughs> right? So <laughs> it's going to hit you. When an exercise missile is coming your way, yeah. back in those days, now they have those fancy, those, you know, those machines you've seen on YouTubes that shoot out like yeah. um, hyper bullets. But back then you didn't have anything. So when the exercise, there's nothing you do. It's going to hit you. But they don't want you running around like your hair's on fire. So they just give you checklists to do. And then the last one, hang on. I thought for the longest time the climate was like that. Right. Stop using plastic straws. Fly less. Recycle your, okay, okay. I feel like I'm doing good. I feel like, and then the last one. Hang on, right? <laughs> Hellscape coming, dystopian end of world coming. Then did you see that movie with Jennifer Lawrence and that boy Leonardo DiCaprio, the one about the you know the the, the comet, the meteor that was coming to Earth? It was like big last yes, year. Yes, 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 yes. What happened in that movie? The meteor hit. The whole movie is about all these. It's like Al Gore talking with Constantine. Is there anything we can do about the meteor? Is this the way we can stop the meteor? They're all talking about this for an hour and a half, and then in the last minute, everybody. Hang on. And that was a moment where I realized, oh, no, actually everybody's given up on this. Everybody thinks we're doomed. But by the way, I was just, spoiler alert, yeah. we're not. Uh, there's good news coming. Well, you just gave away the end of the film, so I'm <laughs> right. glad that this has a different ending. This has a different ending. So what, so what can we do? You said you want to get into the, the third thing. Yeah. Is there a solution? Are you going to do something on climate change now? Yeah, yeah, totally. What, what are you doing? If you had have again asked me, after 20 or so, 30 years working in this, the one rule of thumb that I had was there's no such thing as a silver bullet. There's no thing 
right? The one thing, right? You know, that curly out of that movie City Slickers, you mm. know, what's the one thing? It, when it comes to poverty, when it comes to conflict, when it comes to alleviating human misery, when it comes to unlocking human potential, the kind of thing, the work that I'm, we're engaged in, it's lots of things. But I never really believed there was like big, big world-changing things. And when it came to climate, certainly not. But then I came here to World Vision and about I was here for, I can't remember exactly, six to eight weeks or so. And I was, it was a moment between the lockdowns and um, I got a chance to go and visit one of our major donors, a person by the name of Nick. So I'm sitting with Nick and I asked him, why are you uh, supporting World Vision? And he says, um, well, you have, the, you have the, the miracle. I go, we have what? <laughs> he goes, you have the, the miracle thing. I go, what's the miracle thing? <laughs> like I've been here for two months. I would have been, yeah. we have a miracle thing. Why didn't they tell me day yeah, one? Why didn't anyone tell me day one? We have a miracle <laughs> thing. He goes, no, it's not called a miracle thing. So <laughs> he, I, I go, he goes, it's got F, it's F something or other, F, M. He was trying to think. And then I said, well, what is it? And he said that you guys have discovered something that's truly world-changing. And I said, well, what is this thing we've discovered that's world-changing? And he said, well, you've discovered, you have a guy that works for you called Tony, and he was in Nigeria like decades ago. And Nigeria is like the most degraded, it's the poster child of environmental degradation. You know, we've been talking for years about, you know, the Sahara and the mm -hmm. top, when you see a map of Africa, you know, the top part's yellow and then the bottom part's green. The yellow bit is the Sahara Desert. And mm -hmm. what we've been saying for decades is that every year that Sahara Desert grows a little bit. It grows a few miles, a few miles, a few miles. And everybody's worried that it's going to consume all of Africa as it grows. Yep. Niger is like the poster child of the spread of the Sahara Desert. That country is now almost entirely, has been entirely overwhelmed by desert. And so it has all the impacts of that, famine, uh, the movement of refugees and people, uh, lack of uh, extreme poverty is the result of that. And he was working there. And his job was to plant trees to try to stop um, all of this, you know, the desert spreading. And he'd been there for a few years and he'd been planting millions of trees. And he loves trees. Like he's in a tree person, tree agronomist. I don't know what the technical term <laughs> is. A guy that studied like tree growing. Okay. Yeah? So he... Um, He's planting trees, and after a few years he realizes he's not planting trees, he's killing trees, and he's killing them by the millions because he's planting these, like, seedlings, and he's bringing them mostly their exotic stock, meant to be drought-resistant, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But he, so he has a little tree, like seedlings, and he plants them half, there's little roots, mm -hmm. and he goes out into the Sahara Desert, you know, clears a little hole in the ground, mm -hmm. puts a little tree in the Sahara Desert, push, like, like the movies, yeah. it's all yellow, Covers it up. One tree at a time. What, and, and he, well, he's doing millions of those, but one tree at a time. He does millions and they all die. And after a few years of doing this, he's despairing. And he's driving back in the desert and he's driving in sand. And so he stops the car to let some air out of the tyre so that the car can, you know, manoeuvre in the sand. Mm -hmm. And he's pulled up there. And he's looking out across the horizon and he's full of despair. I've been here for years. I'm not dending this at all. This desert is spreading. It's a lost cause. And as he's gazing out on the horizon, he notices these little green, tiny little, like when I say tiny, like half basketball size shrubs mm. all over the, dotting all over the landscape. And one of them is quite near where he's standing, so he walks over to it. And he's, he's been driving through this desert and seen these little shrubs for a long time. He never actually walked up to one of them. This time he stopped and his shrub's just there, and so he walks up. And as he approaches, he says, leaves are like the fingerprints of a species. So he said, you can tell by just looking at a leaf what bush or what shrub you're looking at. So he looks at the leaf and he realizes, this is not a shrub, that's a tree leaf. And he looks more closely and he realizes that what he thought was a bush is actually a tree trunk that has these tendril shoots of the tree trying to grow, but it's unconstrained. And so all of these shoots and tendrils are competing with one another to grow and they're effectively strangling each other and they now appear like a bush. 
And what he realized in that moment was that as a forest grows over generations, as the tree canopy grows, the root system that grows underneath it is like a reflection of the tree system above. So it's like a mirrored forest. So it's like an enormous tree canopy, enormous root network immediately underneath it. Yeah. And that even if you come in and cut down all of the trees, the root system, the root system stays because it's found water, it's found nutrients, it's living. And all that sticks up above the surface are these little stumps, but they can't become trees again because they're strangling themselves. And so what he did is he just started this experiment where he just started trimming them. He just cut away a whole bunch of these different tendrils and allowed just a couple of them to dominate. And what he discovered was you could regrow entire trees in four years, not 25 years. You know, a tree to get to a full tree length is normally a two-decade process. But because it has the root system, it's like turbocharged. And so the tree just goes pop. In four years, it appears. And it's not just trees that pop up. You can regenerate entire forests from desert to forest in four to six years. So this, he discovers this in Niger and starts doing it, and these forests appear. And then all these farmers start hearing about this. And it's a more complicated than this slightly in how he convinced the farmers to do it, but he did. He has regenerated in Niger 5 million hectares of forest. In Niger, he has stopped the spread of the desert and he has reforested half of the arable land of that country. Niger is no longer the same place that it was. He has turned it around, and not just him, the thousands of farmers working with him, of course, but he turned it around in Niger. So this is all part of the story to Nick. Nick tells me this story. <laughs> and at the end of the story, I was like, well, that is like, um, that's, there are entire forests that exist around the world that are just underneath the surface and that they want to become forests again and they can't because they're just strangling themselves. And then if we go in and we just cut the tendrils away, the entire trees and forest system will regrow in four to six years. Nick says, yes, that's the story. And then I said, and there's a guy called Tony who invented this in a place called Niger. Yes, there's a guy called Tony in Niger. And I said, and World Vision, this is a World Vision thing. He goes, yes. And then I thought, oh, hold on a second. World Vision is the biggest charity on earth. This is some other World Vision, not World Vision Australia. He goes, this is World Vision Australia. You have this. I said, but Australia is the worst in the world at climate. We suck at everything to do with climate. Everybody hates us because of what we do with climate. How could we come up with this miraculous thing? And no one even in Australia go, oh, we have this miraculous thing. I go, why doesn't the prime minister talk about this the whole time? He, and then I said, he goes, no, it's you. It's World Vision Australia. And then I thought, oh, hold on a second. This Tony, he's over in Niger. And uh, Nick says, no, 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 he's come back from Niger. He's in your office in Burwood in Melbourne. <clears throat> I was like, I would have met this Tony. And then he's like, no, he's there. So I get in my car <laughs> and I literally come rushing back to the office. I ran in the door and a receptionist named Gina. I said, Gina, do we have a Tony in the office? She's like, we have quite a few Tonys in the office. Not as many Andrews. We have like a lot of Andrews. Right. I don't know about the big We have so many Andrews. But we have quite a few Tonys. Yep. And I said, the forest Tony. She goes, we do. And in fact, he's here today. So I, I run upstairs. And there is this guy sitting there at his cube. Sweetest guy. Like five foot ten, gray haired, in his 60s. Tapping away at his laptop. And I ran up to him. And I said, are you Tony the forest guy? He says, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm Tony the... Because he's actually, there's a documentary made on him and he's called the forest maker, right? right? He really is Tony the forest guy. And then I go, is it all true? He goes, is what all true? I go, the forest, the roots, the canopy, the four years, the accelerated. He goes, yes, it's all true. I said, five million hectares in Niger. Is that true? Yes, that's true. And then I said, do you have any evidence of this? He goes, I have the photos from space. Yep. I said, you have 
<laughs> you have photos from space about this? He goes, yeah, satellites. Because there's so many millions of hectares, the only way you can pick it up is by taking photos from space, from satellite. I go, so we have satellite pictures of something going from desert to forest. He goes, we have lots of those. Then I said, what? Are you like James Bond? Are you keeping the whole thing secret? So I said, bring me down to my office, bring me all the photos. So he comes down and he puts all the photos out. It's like Jenny Craig on steroids. It's like <laughs> desert Niger, green forest, desert Ethiopia, green forest, desert Somalia, green forest, dry lands, northern Kenya, forest, dry lands, Uganda. You get the point. Yeah. Photo, 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 photo. And then I, I, I said, where, this is more than Niger. He goes, we do this in 25 countries now. I said, get out the map of Africa. So he pulls out a map of Africa. I say, where are you? Am I answering this too long? No. He said, I go, where are you doing this? In Africa. And then he, he puts the map out. And like I said to you earlier, you know, maps of Africa, they're like yellow on the top yep. and then they're green. There's a bit in the middle between where it goes yellow and where it goes green, and that's called the Sahel region of Africa, S-A-H-E-L. And the Sahel region is the region that is being converted from green forest, green land, green farmland into desert. It's called the Sahel region. And he puts his finger down and he goes, we are doing FMNR, which is what this is called, Farmer Managed Natural Regeneration. Yeah. We wanted to give it a name so that it would be kept secret. He points at his map and he goes, well, there you go from Mauritania. He goes to the far west of Africa. He runs his finger through Senegal, Ghana. He runs it across Cameroon. He runs it into Uganda, runs it into Kenya. He runs it into Somalia, Ethiopia. He runs his hand right along the entire Sahel. And so I looked at him. I said, do you know what you're doing? He goes, um, yeah, I'm, I'm reforesting grassland. I said, you're stopping the spread of the Sahara Desert. And he looks down at the map and says, oh, yeah, no. You know, I suppose we're helping stop the... <laughs> I was like, do you, like, do you tell anyone about this? Because this is, like, super awesome. I said, is there a T-shirt with this written on it? <laughs> What's written on what T-shirt? I said, you should have a T-shirt. I am stopping the spread of the Sahara Desert. We'll all wear it. This is, like, world-changing. Yeah. He goes, yeah, no, it has the potential to be world. He's the sweetest person. That's my so humble incredible. person. Then I think to myself, because the way, you know, um, forests work, mm -hmm. it's why everybody panics about Amazon and all the, you know, the deforestation of Amazon. The Amazon, if you heard, probably heard this concept, the Amazon's like a vacuum cleaner. Yes. Right, so forests pull carbon out of the atmosphere and clean the atmosphere like a vacuum cleaner. Yeah, they call it the world's lungs, don't they? The, the lungs world's lungs, the world. that kind of thing. Yeah, they, That's where they, you're converting it from carbon dioxide to oxygen. But they also have an impact like a vacuum cleaner on carbon. And so I said to him, well, this is, you're creating forests. I said, could this have an impact on climate? And he said, yes, actually, there's been research done on this. This can have a very big impact on climate. And so I said, this is really how the conversation went. I said, well, how, what could we do to have a real big impact on climate? He said, well, you need to take about 25% of carbon out of the atmosphere. And so I said, well, does this approach you have with the forests? Can that take out 25% of carbon? He goes, well, if we regenerate enough forests, we could pull 25% of carbon out of the atmosphere and slow down climate change. So then I said, well, how much forest would we need to regenerate to slow down climate change? He said, the science is also done on this, one billion hectares. Now, I didn't really realize at the time how big that was, but <laughs> he, it sounded very doable to me. So then I said, one billion hectares. And I said, is there like available underground forest? Because that's what you need, all these underground yeah. forests. I said, is there enough underground forest to like uh, regenerate? He goes, yeah, I think there's, there's, a, there's around 3 billion hectares. 
It's something like 24% of the world's forests are degraded. It, in poor areas, it's 42%. It's degraded like this. 42% of the forest land, farmlands, the poor people live on, are degraded but have the potential to be regenerated. 42%. And so I said, well, we should do that. And he said, we should absolutely do this. Let's do one billion hectares of forest. Are we in agreement? He said, I am in agreement. And we shook hands. That night I called my daughter up. I thought, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> I have good news. Finally, I come bearing good news. I don't suck anymore. She goes, what do you mean you don't suck anymore? I go, you blame me for years for not being able to do anything about climate change. That's right. I go, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. That's incredible. Mm. And so how close to the billion hectares are you now? World Vision has already done millions of hectares, as I've said. We're already in 25 countries and we're now accelerating it. So our goal is to do 50 million over the next few years and create a global movement mm. that then takes that and does the 1 billion. So we're at the beginning of that. But I expect in 10 years' time that we will regenerate 1 billion hectares. And we're not hearing about this anyway. Why isn't this being spoken about at the World Economic Forum? Somehow we're so bad at telling this story. The only way I know how to tell this story so far is this very convoluted process of talking with Nick and getting the whole forest thing. Mm -hmm. We've got to come up with a better way of telling this. But it's true. And we have before and after shots. Yep. So actually I've been trying, we've been trying to get a meeting lined up with Baz Luhrmann, you know, the, the director. Yeah. Because I want to talk to like genius storyteller and say, we have the greatest, I think, one of the greatest stories on earth right now and we're not telling it well. And it, when you tell this, it's so amazing. It's so simple. It's so doable that I think people think it can't be true. But it is. I want to wrap up. I'm sure there's more to that story and I'm sure you could expand on it. And uh, it's called FMNR, Pharma Managed Natural Regeneration. Mm -hmm. It works as a mnemonic. Do you know how I remember it? How? Yeah. You know that, that Muppet song? Mana, mana. Do, 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 do. <laughs> FM, mana. Do, do, do. Good. We'll try that. So if you, if you need to remember it or you need to Google it or look it up. I don't think Gen Z knows about the Muppets. But. <laughs> Before we wrap up for the day, you mentioned earlier climate change contributing to the refugee crisis. Yeah. In what way? I mean, the obvious is well, one of the less things, farming. Yeah, one of the things that Al Gore said uh, in the Davos speech that we will have one billion people on the move based on climate and he gave the example of what happened in the mid-teens of 2000s when the one million refugees from Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq and Iran went into Germany and the destabilisation that happened because of that. So we talked about we have already seen the political destabilisation that occurs when you have large-scale movement of people, that's one million. What will happen if it's one billion people? We'll see whole societies collapse. We would lose our capacity for self-governance on this world. We have to act. So in answer to your question, I would so say... So it turns out the 600,000 Hiroshima bombs was the good part of his speech. Yeah, This is the bad part. All of society will collapse with one billion people moving. Yeah. How many refugees in the world at the moment? At the moment, there's about 27 million refugees. And we've seen, we've seen the, the xenophobia created just by the just movement by of refugees moment. around the world now. That's with 27 million. So but you can even, of the tw even of the 27 million, 26 million of those, much actually more, 99% of refugees never get further than the country next door. Only 1% of refugees ever end up in a place like America or Australia or Canada or, or um, Europe. Only one, less than 1% actually end up there. So all this stuff that we're hearing, the scaremongering and everything else, is not occurring because of 27 million. It's occurring because of about 50 or 60,000 people every year. And there was 1 million that did move to Germany in, I think, 2014. Yeah. So why does climate change cause this? For most people in the world, the environment is the economic engine that your community is built on. The land that you live on, is the land that gives you your water. It gives you the fodder for your goats and your cows. It gives you the trees to make fuel for your stove. 
It gives you the leaves and palm fronds to help make your roof. It gives you your life emerges from the richness of the ground and the soil and the land that you live in. And so as that land is degraded, it's like having a bank account and every year losing 5% of the value that you have. And at some point, there's just not enough in your bank account to keep your kids alive. That's degradation and it's going on in so many different parts of the world and that's a, a feature of a change and shifting in climate. Because of that, there's no future for kids, so people move. Yep, They can't get enough water, they can't get enough fodder, their animals begin dying, and we call that famine, right? That's the end result of this. Mm. Yep. Or hunger crisis, things like that. But you also then have mass flooding, you have uh, super fires. Uh, you, you, you know, CSIRO in Australia did the research. The super fires that we have are ha happening because of climate change. Yep. So you have large-scale emergency events, fires, floods, uh, you have that also occurring, which speed up the movement of people. So even people that are not immediately in an area that's been, de you know, become desert, they're being affected by all these other things and they're also moving. Because of that, there's less and less resources and as people compete and fight over those resources, they have civil wars and they have conflict and they have rebels and they have crime. And because of that, people also move. And so all of these things compound and compound and compound. And in the end, most refugees leave not because they see, and I get this will be contentious for many people, and we'll use another episode to talk about why I believe this. We did research on this. But we often think that refugees leave because they run out of basic needs. But what we have found is that most refugees leave when they no longer see a future for their children where they are. They'll put up with going without food. They'll put up with a lot of insecurity. They'll put up with a lot of things. But what no parent can put up with is the realization that their child, if they stay, has no future and may die. Yep. Then people get up and move. And climate is part of that whole mix of things driving that. We will address that in another episode, as you said, with a a countless questions about refugees and refugee camps specifically. But um, we do have to leave today. Please ensure you follow along on the podcast, subscribe on Apple or Spotify and share the podcast with your friends. An incredibly uplifting and optimistic message and story from today's episode. Uh, you can follow Daniel, as I mentioned, Daniel Wordsworth on Instagram and TikTok. And uh, we'll talk to you again in the next step. Good. Thank you, Fitz. <laughs>